Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, recovery machines and recovery in general. A little bit of history on this. Uh, in the early 90s, I'm not going to give you dates on this, uh, the EPA passed some laws that required us to recover refrigerant. Now prior to that, we used to simply just dump it to the atmosphere. Well, it started out we had to recover our 12, 500, 502, uh, 22. But we didn't have to recover 134A, which is a non-ozone depleting product. But later on we had to do that too. So, what we started out with, and <laughs> it was pretty hilarious, the, the machines we had. You could make your own machine. Uh, you can't do that anymore. Uh, you could buy machines and what essentially most of the manufacturers did was take household refrigerator compressors and use them in recovery machines. Every one of which failed. They all failed. They're, it was like a cascade of garbage. So there was very little uh, continuity. It nothing seemed to work for quite a while so what they did a little later is they started using uh, quote oilless compressors now they were a, a compressor design that did not require a lot of oil it did require some oil but it would uh, they would last longer we had a lot of those fail too and they're getting pretty good now. Now you can look at this one here. This is a uh, back rack stinger, brand shiny new. And these have been pretty good. You know, I'm not saying they're the only one out there that's any good, but uh, they've actually been pretty good. So what do they really do? What does a recovery machine do? Okay, it, w it acts like a condensing unit. Essentially that's what it really is, is a condensing unit. There's a compressor inside here, and if you look over here, you can see a coil. And if you look on the other side, you'll see a fan. Okay, there's a compressor inside there, and this condenser that we just looked at, so what it does is draw refrigerant in and condense it and then it pumps it out into a storage cylinder. So it removes the gas without dumping it to the air. Now these things are widely advertised that you can recover liquid with them. And I'm going to tell you straight off, don't do it. They give you cautions and so on like that. I mean, I used to teach this stuff to entry-level people, and we pretty much have a cascade of broken recovery machines uh, because of so much liquid slugging in there. Uh, it's like any compressor, it will slug, and it can damage compressor. I always recover gas and I'll show you how I speed it up. Supposedly you can speed it up faster by recovering liquid. And that's true, but you're going to end up with uh, some possible failures. And these are not cheap machines. They run anywhere from a cheapie of $400 to $1,000. And so the, these are uh, fairly expensive machines and you just assume the thing wasn't broke anyway so you can continue doing your work. So uh, this is pretty much the standard now. It's the only thing legally you can use. Uh, there were some, well I suppose some of the old ones that you you made out of old refrigeration compressors and stuff would still be legal but uh, none of them are working anymore so. Uh, so this is what you're going to use. When we first got these things out, we, got a, oh, we grumbled quite a bit because they were uh, 
well, first we had all the failures. Uh, and, of course, that was one of the worst things. But uh, it was going to take longer to do everything. And it does take a little bit longer. But there's ways that you can use the time that you're waiting on this thing for other things. For one thing, this is one of the first things you bring out when you're going to have to take the refrigerant out. You'll hook it up, fire it off, and then you can bring all the rest of the stuff. Those of you that have been in the business know that if I'm doing something like replacing a compressor, I carry more junk out there. There's vacuum pumps, gauge sets, tools, scales, nitrogen, just all kinds of junk that you've got to take out there to work on it. So you can work this around so it actually does a pretty fair job and you don't have to wait for it. Some of the machines, you know, this has got a high side and a low side gauge, high side here, low side there, just like a... Uh, a manifold gauge set and you actually don't have to have a manifold gauge set to use this thing. I always did. but uh, So what it's going to do is it's going to start pulling refrigerant out of the system and this gauge which is going to read when you first start it's going to read saturated. Both of them probably read saturated when you uh, pressure it up. And this is going to start dropping because the evaporating temperature of the refrigerant is dropping because you're boiling and eventually it's going to get down you know I can't remember for sure I, this thing doesn't even tell you on the install instructions but the EPA regs were supposed to go to 15 inches of vacuum and that depends on that's the most you you have to do there's some cases where you can do less but uh, and that's all CFC information for uh, the CFC test. But this thing is going to suck down here. This is going to go up to a condensing temperature and eventually the machine will shut off by itself. Uh, and I think it does shut off at that 15 inches. I'll have to test this one to find out. I don't really know for sure. This machine pretty much takes care of itself. Usually you it's pretty hard to destroy these things except for the liquid. Uh, if it overpressures, there's a pressure switch shuts it off. And of course there's a vacuum switch that shuts it off when it reaches the, uh, the, the necessary vacuum. The next video I talk about on these things is how to set one of these up uh, and how to pull refrigerant out of a system. So that's just a little introductory to the refrigerant recovery machine.